Okay, let's start. Welcome everyone to this uh, first session of the roundtable sessions uh, in uh, communication design for emergency. Uh, this is a collaborative uh, grant uh, between the Notre Dame University in the, in the United States and uh, Universidad Católica de Chile in Chile. Uh, we are working together with uh, Professor Clinton Carson that is uh, introducing uh, uh, later. Uh, and we are really pleased to have today this first uh, guest to present their projects in uh, the specific topic of the evacuation of tsunami. Uh, we have uh, many challenges to, to see, to share about the communication in this very critical scenario, as you will see. Uh, and we are planning to uh, continue these uh, sessions of uh, roundtables uh, in uh, along uh, 2023. Uh, this is a collaborative grant, uh, and we will include other activities that uh, Clinton will also introduce. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Ramirez. I am a professor of the School of Design at uh, Universidad Católica, UC Chile. Um, very pleased to have this international uh, event here to open the discussion, to open the dialogue about the communication uh, in the emergency context. So Clinton, please uh, tell us more about this uh, session and your impressions. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Clinton Carlson. Uh, I'm a visual communication design faculty here at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and really, you know, this project started about a year ago uh, when Rodrigo reached out. Uh, the Luxic Family uh, Collaboration Grant is a grant that supports and connects research from Notre Dame to UC Chile. And um, he, had, he had, uh, was looking to see if we, our, our research interests intersected. And uh, we began talking about potential ways to, to pursue research and then really began to form this, this idea of this project. We received initial funding with the Luxic Family Grant to start these roundtables and to do some initial research this coming year uh, between the two universities that'll engage community and, and experts in emergency response. And uh, so we're really excited to, to have everybody join today um, and looking forward to the conversation, kind of recognizing too that this isn't the beginning of this conversation. These conversations have been happening um, and, and we're um, beginning our, our collaboration in this, but we're also looking for uh, partners that might um, collaborate with us in the future. So the goal of the LUCSIC grant is to make research ties between our institutions, but then foster opportunities for further research. And that's really one of our underlying goals is to give evidence of the power of design to uh, rethink and reimagine uh, the, the emergency responses and, and preparation in the future, um, but also look for those larger organizations and, and and researchers that we can partner with to pursue further funding, so. Well, thank you, Clinton. Uh, I would like also to, to say thanks to the Design Network for Emergency Management. Uh, I'm a part, I'm a founder of this uh, international network. Claudine is also a, a co-founder of, of this uh, network and we are really happy to support this uh, event uh, along the, the, this, uh, the, the, the sessions that, that we, we, we will have. Um, the other part that I would like to say thanks is the CIGIDEN, the, the Center for Research in uh, Disaster Management in Chile. Uh, they are doing a really profound, uh, really deep work in how to communicate for different emergency scenarios and they were really interested to support these uh, roundtable sessions. Um, also, I would like to, to say thanks to the team of uh, Design for Emergency, uh, Bernie, uh, Clinton, Jason, Javiera, and Javiera. Uh, this is uh, the, the team that is uh, supporting and creating all these uh, elements that you are seeing today. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we are uh, trying to uh, prototype and, and, and refine some things from this uh, first uh, session. Uh, we are also planning uh, to, to have a second session in the beginning of uh, March. Uh, I'm probably uh, uh, 
telling you no 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 we we are just uh, we, we have this uh, conversation pendant but probably we will come back with the second session in the topic of uh, food recall food security and how this can be affected by the emergency scenarios well uh, at, before to start i would like to say thanks also uh, to claudine and jorge for their presentations today the structure of this roundtable will be uh, Claudine first uh, will present uh, cognition and wayfinding uh, for disaster planning, and then Jorge will present their, his project about fostering tsunami resilience through vertical evacuations. You, you will see, and we, we hope that uh, creating a, a good dialogue after the presentations, everyone will have 20 minutes uh, to present, and then we are creating, creating a space of 30 minutes uh, for dialogue, for comments, for questions, uh, please write down, take notes uh, for that uh, specific session. And this is, uh, dialogue session is moderated by my colleague and friend, uh, researcher also in, in topics about the uh, crisis and emergency, Jose Alar. We are really happy, Jose, to have it uh, here today, your, your moderation. Okay, I, I don't know if I forgot something, uh, Clinton, or, or we are giving the, the screen to, to Globin. Yeah, the only thing I would add is uh, just a reminder to visit our website. We just got a, a kind of initial website up and you can reach out and connect with us and let us know if you see something that you wanna participate in in the future. Um, uh, check that out and uh, connect with us in that way. Yes, well, the, the, the link of the website is D4 number. Uh, emergency.org uh, probably you have seen in the in the welcome screen that uh, we passed uh i'm really happy uh, to start this this session uh saying thanks also to all the people that is connecting from all around the world literally uh virgin islands new zealand chile of course the united states of course the netherlands uh people from mexico uh from canada uh, i'm sorry i'm probably forgetting a lot of uh, different places that these people connecting to this first session uh well no more no more words uh, claudine the screen is yours to present thank you Perfect. thank you okay let's see that i'm setting this up okay do we see full screen we did this rehearsal Full screen, good. All right, um, thank you so much for having me. It's so amazing to see a lot of familiar faces and new faces. Um, my name is Claudine Yenishin. I'm a professor at Chapman University. I uh, teach in uh, graphic design undergraduate program, but I'm an information designer. And I'll sort of slowly walk on how, how all of us find our way into this specific topic on emergencies. Um, I will say I wanted to be a first responder as my life goals. And I was denied that by my parents and I ended up at CalArts uh, with Jose. <laughs> and um, I really had that instinct to wanna go out and be first responder uh, and be you know, the, the more boots on the ground uh, kind of person and realized very quickly that I was not cut out for that skill set and, and ran back to design. So um, here I just was able to carve out uh, a niche, I guess, in the design that I was good at, that I could do, that I did have the skill set for in the space of emergency management. Um, and through that, I also found like-minded people like Rodrigo and Saskia and Klaus um, and Tingy that we had started to form this group called the Design Network for Emergency Management. I always include this now in my all my talks is I hope that we start to talk about inclusion and accessibility at the forefront of talking about emergency public information. In my experience, it's never been at the forefront. It's always been an afterthought or secondary to talking about any kind of communication campaign. And two years ago, working with FEMA, I really pivoted my work and realizing the work that I have done is pretty 
exclu exclusion. And I realize the ableism, the uh, assumptions I have made in the work that only address people with certain cognitive and visual abilities. So by recognizing that, by acknowledging that, I'm working towards this idea of alternative formats. And I hope that we can do that as a group, um, as, we, as this grant and this project of a seed uh, begins to unfold, that that becomes part of the conversation. So in for some of you, and I see a lot of familiar face, faces here teaching undergrads in a traditional graphic design program, we have the target audience, you know, we have the users, um, it's always specificity, it's always, you know, make sure we're targeting a certain group. But what we do as a public service, as a public campaign, is we're really hitting the diverse group of the public, and that's the most complicated, the most complex the visual communication um, journey, right, to be able to acknowledge the diversity, the cultures, the previous trainings, the care, the interest, um, the cognition that I'll talk about more of, and, and language, and so much more of that. So um, when we say that we have our end user in the room, do we truly have that? Do we tr can we truly understand who all those people are and where the messaging is going, being understood, being remembered, being effective? Um, one of the first things I did in grad school, so I so I did search and rescue. That after CalArts, I, I joined a search and rescue because I could not shake the fact that I was meant to be a first responder. I was like, I'm, I was meant to be a first responder. I had my graphic design BFA, but I'm like, no. You know, I joined the sheriff department in Santa Barbara. Um, and a really quick story, because I only have 20 minutes, is you have to go through certification. So avalanche training, um, there's different specialties within that that you go through in your one year training. When I went through Swiftwater certification, this is when I, believe it or not, when I first started thinking about cognition, never in my undergraduate training as a designer did I ever think about psychology. And it was because I was, I did book work, I did tactics for Swiftwater training. The third day was going to be the certification where we entered an actual, um, the Kurd River. And with that process, I had to get rescued during that training. Um, and it was the first time ever I was on the bank. I just got rescued. It took a long time because no one ever thought during a training, it would turn into a, a real life rescue that I thought about what happened. I was book taught. I was, I knew my knots. I was top of my class. I felt confident yet. When I entered that water that day, I did, had this really quiet panic. I didn't zip up my vest. I didn't put on my helmet and I just swept down the river doing everything that I knew killed victims and doing it at the same time at, at certain moments. So this idea of cognition and how quickly it can change really became that first sort of model for me of this transition of reading and um, viewing and comprehension, and that things can change really quickly. Just a really um, quick note, the difference between urgent and 911. Uh, so in the States, 911 is the first responder phone number that you call for police, fire, uh, paramedics. That's the 911 is immediate environmental clues that change, smoke, shaking of the floor. Um, you know, it's it, it's where you are primitive, you're relying on primitive response. That's different than urgent, where urgent's like a heightened sense of my child is sick, I have to go to their urgent care. So th there's a bit of a difference between the two. But in the arrows represent how those things can switch depending on those environmental clues. So I really got into cognition at Reading. I really understood that this was important as a designer. Um, I read this amazing book by Amanda Ripley called The Unthinkable. And this might seem oversimplistic, but I thought it was a really great way to illustrate processing in crisis. She breaks down three phases, denial, deliberate, and decide. And that each individual in that tapestry of the public will go through those different phases, maybe not even make it through all of them. Maybe someone would stay in denial, right? But we kind of go through these phases um, very differently. Um, some quickly, some you know, not even making it past the first phase, but uh, she breaks down these different scenarios as well. And what's interesting about it is that the sense of denial will always happen. It's a human uh, cognitive response of the sense of, is this happening? Even when the earth is shaking, right? Uh, you live in California. So if there's an earthquake, you're, you freeze for one second to take in the new clues that has happening to your previous environment. Deliberate is deciding what to do next. And then deciding is actually physically moving. 
And what I like about this model is it's it breaks it down very simply, but it doesn't mean that the end result's always right, right? It, that those three things can happen and the decision can be wrong. So I just think it's really great to illustrate that as we keep in mind that it's not just things that we're designing, but it's also happening in a scenario. It also has to perform whether before in preparedness, during, and even after when the cognition has been compressed and there's a lot of demands. And there's also these phenomenons. So, um, I really understood or was really investigating psychology of disaster, um, emergency psychology, psychology of ingress, emergency egress and ingress, which are very specific uh, psychology uh, topics and um, um, specialties. So through that, there's things like uh, crowd psychology, tunnel vision, um, temporary cognitive paralysis, which is that freezing, you know, that moment that you're, you can't make a decision. And the biggest one is the unconscious personality, which is one of the founding psychology um, theories that everyone has an unconscious personality that we may not have met. I met mine, me and my unconscious personality met very closely when I had to get rescued during that uh, search and rescue training where um, I had this temporary cognitive paralysis. I heard water, I saw wa white water, and it wasn't like I was screaming, you know, raising my hands. It was this internal, in. Um, not the inability to make any kind of decisions that I was just uh, trained in. And the really important thing to understand is none of this is, um, uh, but, uh, sorry, it doesn't discriminate. So it doesn't discriminate against education, uh, where you live, uh, language. The only thing that does help this is training. So we have first responders who are trained in risk environments, uh, the military, people like that who do this over and over again, start to work on that unconscious personality to be able to uh, see what the expectation or outcome uh, would be different than some of these uh, cognitive phenomenons. So I did a study, 90% of my participants do not look at or do not know their emergency procedures before a disaster. So that means there are calling up their information they're calling up they're they're googling should i evacuate uh, what should i take the t at the time of evacuation uh, because the interest isn't just there it's it's not not caring it's priority right they just haven't prepared and it's not until the point of impact that they're learning new information learning new procedures which is the worst time to be learning new information um i love using the faa's sort of redundant repetitive safety procedures that happens over and over to the point people are like plugging in their ears, you know, um, they're rolling their eyes. Uh, a few times I, I've watched people and there's someone's paying attention, but it is the same theories of branding of a good repetitious, consistent, cohesive messaging that happens over and over again. So this kind of mental map, this development is happening beforehand. So when the plane does throw down the yellow thing that's so weirdly coming from the ceiling, a lot of people who have flown before will know that's oxygen, right? They can retain some of that information through that repetition on an unconscious level. Some people might even remember that you put that um, oxygen mask on yourself first before any vulnerable uh, members like an elderly person or a child, which is counterintuitive because that's the repetition that happens before the time of crisis. So I like using that as a framework when I'm working with emergency management. Um, just to, I'm, and this is really fast, so I'm, I'm happy with the discussion and we can ask more questions because there's a study on this. And um, But I love illustrating this just as a recent pandemic. When there's no, and I'm in the States, so I, I know it's different uh, for wherever you're, you're living, but when there's no messaging that's cohesive, consistent, and in, on another level, combative or, or um, they're, they're um, countering or opposite of each other, then the public has to make up what is necessary. And we get into what was panic buying. Um, and we it's that crowd psychology. That's why people bought toilet paper. It wasn't the public's fault. It was because messaging was so scattered and not co consistent, cohesive. We were in a compression state of, of um, pressure with our cognition. And so we just were learning from each other on the fly. And so we saw a lot of panic buying. And even though we can criticize like toilet paper, you know, really like it was, that was the output of that compression. Um, when I worked in grad school, I said, well, actually back when I was, after I got rescued and I was sitting on the bank and I was like, 
I'm going back to design. This is, I'm not cut out for this. Um, during grad school, I researched emergency management evacuation instructions. In instructions. I didn't say maps, I said evacu evacuation instructions, and I got all maps. Super interesting because that's what emergency management was providing to the public are these maps. And it was a different kinds of uh, scenarios, different disasters. And I thought first as an infrastructure, that was really interesting. Um, when I looked further, so I just came out of grad school with Jack Bertine's semiology of graphics, right? So I was really just nerded out on analyzing in depth what these maps were actually doing. And some of that, um, that vocabulary on the side there was saying, you know, how visual variables, which is typography, color, stroke weights, um, uh, stroke alignments, and then how they all interacted with each other in this layering. And then how much of it did someone have to decode all of that? to actually get meaningful information. Um, I loved coming across this uh, hurricane evacuation map from Texas. High res, definitely you can download it. Uh, someone can print this out on an eight and a half by 11. So that would be the ultimate size is an eight and a half by 11 printout or um, on screen. I'm diving deep here. And so with all of that visual density, the actual important instructions here is the blue routes. The blue routes are the evacuation routes. And then if you really look hard enough and you have the visually, visual ability to do so, you could see the checkered, excuse me, blue and white routes, which is counterflow. So that's another level of instructions that's telling people from um, Houston that those highways will be counterflow all one way going up to Dallas. So let me just go back here. So we can see this being very dense. Um, the angular legibility is how they, all the angles of those lines are interacting, making visual noise, making it us harder to see what the actual information is. And it, and it continued. And I know Yvette's there. Yvette's here with us. I'm, so uh, she's from the California Governor's Office of Emergency Management, who we've been partnering for, gosh, I think since 2008, since I came back from grad school. My first pilot city was Santa Barbara. Um, they showed this map uh, repurposed from the California GIS on the inundation zones. Uh, the emergency manager, um, with good intention, put this back on the public facing brochure business card size to show us, you know, they just they put it back there as, as part of their evacuation information campaign. So I took that. And what I like the work I'm about to show you is not maps. I like to call them more diagrams. Um, so the map here is this very accurate GIS um, data driven map. I think it's to your right. Um, I created rules for every single color used for every single line weight. Um, so anything on there had a function. And so the first prototype here is for, this, for Santa Barbara. Uh, these maps are not accurate. They are, I like to call them the, the liars. Like I, I like to be dramatic. So like they're big lies because if you overlay them on a GIS map, none of the streets would line up. It wouldn't be exactly where they're supposed to be. Um, they're, the priority is legibility, right? And being able to space that out and um, function. And we put visual, ver uh, visual verbs, which is from Bertine as well, that shows you, we want you to do something. We're instructing you to do something. Um, when I go back here, I just want to show this accuracy. I don't I think you can see my mouse. This inundation line goes right up to the freeway, right? This is uh, Santa Barbara only has one highway in and out. It's the 101. And so working with the emergency management and uh, the California um, governor's office, I was able, they were, I'm like, do you want them to use that freeway? And they said, no that's potential flooding. And so you can see here on the right, the exaggeration made to tell the public, this is a potential, your instinct's gonna wanna jump on that highway. But here, even though this is accurate, what they wanted the public to respond is do not count on that. So these are decisions that were made that the GIS couldn't um, capture, but on the end of public communication that we were actually able to communicate. And you can see here, we highlighted that with the noisiest, buzziest, checkered um, visual language we can use, like be aware your main highway out might be flooded. And so the surface streets that might be counterintuitive might be a nice, a better option. Um, we tested evacuation information, how people remember it, um, audio. So just listening to the evacuation instructions written just with words, which is also a visual activity. 
and then both maps, the original map and then the redesign map. And what we found was audio failed. Sorry, we did a two minute review where they were able to look at it for two minutes and then we called them 24 hours later without any um, exposure to the information and see how much and how accurate they can remember that information. So audio was the worst at immediate and at recall. Written was the best at immediate. Um, and then second, better than at the recall, the, the number one um, at the recall remembering was the visual map. Um, so that told us that there's there might be more processing with maps or the diagrams in the beginning, but it lasted longer in the recall. It lasted longer in memory. Um, and the rest is just showing you this is when Yvette and I was working with uh, Kevin at the Kevin Miller at the time uh, really saw the value in this, and so we were able to put site specific maps. So you'll see like walking where we're in environment, not waiting on a app or a website for participants to go to the information, but met the, met them there where they're at. Walking signs we call these site specific maps, and then the overview of the bird's eye more perspective. Um, uh, citywide maps and all through the coast. I know Yvette and I are trying to collect <laughs> all the coastal cities in California. Um, it becomes a brand of its own. So no matter if it's San Diego, all the way to San Francisco, all the way to Santa Cruz, LA, that someone who sees this on their beach will understand already, have learned the, co the visual language of tsunami um, evacuation uh, maps, or I like to call them diagrams, but uh, their maps to everyone else. And so that just shows you the repetition. This is not, I mean, this is really meant for the preparedness part to just get it into the environment. Um, but we, you know, we go from, and I know this is my aspiration because this is all over the United States. This is very California centric, but we could see a visual language that are being built out, um, uh, you know, just in, on this coastal part of the, of the states. And I, and I just end really quickly and look at the disaster of like and how applicable this is. If we're showing talking about wayfinding, this is the fire stuff that I've been. I live in fire prone where I had to evacuate multiple times, and this is the stuff I get. And I again, knowing my conscious personality, I'm looking at this. And I have no idea what to do because I'm panicked and I don't do well. Um, I live here, and so this was a mandatory, and it just skips me and it goes into warning, and I and I'm like, well, what do I do? I had no idea what to do. I li literally had to call a friend who's in emergency management. They're like, "Oh, it's because this you're not in the county. You're not in the you're not in the boundary. Evacuate." So things like this could be such a mess. And these are for schools and for parents with uni uni reunification plans. Just a, these are the maps given to parents in handbooks about how to for their child to evacuate, how they can find their child, and it's just everywhere. So I just I wanted to end on. I know we're focusing on tsunamis, but there's a systemic approach that's being happening uh, on how we're using maps and um, if we're really intentional, intentional about it. Thank you so much. I hope I'm okay with time. Well, thank you, Claudine, for, for your presentation. Uh, I'm giving now the screen to Jorge to, to present. Jorge is from Valparaíso. Claudine is, is from California, as you have seen in, in her presentation. And Jorge is from Valparaíso, from the uh, Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria Technical University, and a research of, of uh, CIGIDEN also. Go ahead, uh, Jorge, please. Thank you very much, Rodrigo and Jose, for this invitation. I will share my screen now. Um, Yeah, so again, I appreciate this invitation. And today I'm going to talk about uh, vertical evacuation as a resilient action or, or tool for, for tsunami. Uh, uh, every one of you may know, um, Chile is a highly tsunami prone country, uh, as it said there. Um, only through record history, which means from the 15th century. Uh, more than 100 tsunamis have been recorded in the in the country, including 11 highly devastating events. Um, the picture that you can see here is from the 2010 event, uh, event, which hit more than 400 kilometers, I would say, of the of the Chilean coast and caused about 300 human lives around something around that. And um, 
Of course, evacuation probably is the main tool to cope with the with an unfolding tsunami. But the problem that we're having in Chile right now, not, not right now, since <laughs> since Eva, is that we are too close to the area where the actually the earthquake happened. So that means that the tsunami front has a very short time of arrival to the coast. As you may you can see here in the image on the left, you this is um an estimated tsunami arrival time of the Valparaíso and Viña del Mar area. This is Valparaíso, and here is Viña del Mar. And you can see that there you can have times even below 12 minutes after the beginning of the earthquake. So basically, you have to take into account that a, a 9.0 higher magnitude earthquake may last for two to three minutes. And after nine minutes after that earthquake has finished, the first tsunami front may arrive to the city. So you have a very short window of time to evacuate. And the problem is that is uh, when you assess evacuation through modeling or through drills, and you collect those uh, likely evacuation times, as you, as you can see on the figure on the right, you, you will figure out that there are certain areas of the city where evacuation to safe zones may take much longer than the expected arrival time of the tsunami. And that will, lay, that will lead to the conclusion, to the conclusion that you have areas like those ones depicted in red here for the case of Viña del Mar, near Valparaíso, that evacuation probably will not be feasible given the short arrival chance of the tsunami and in comparison to the long distances that the evacuees have to run to reach to those safe high ground. So that's a huge problem that we have in several areas here in the Chilean coastal zone. So basically, um, that's what I was say, talking about, that um, uh, our models and experience shows that we have very short time windows for evacuation. So uh, that brings uh, in front the opportunity of fostering tsunami vertical evacuation. So but, uh, we, when we want to approach that kind of opportunity, we face, we meet the problem that actually in Chile right now, there is no kind of specific certification process to tell the people which building is safe or which building is good for vertical evacuation and which one is not. So the, this project that we, we've been developing in the last two years, and it's a four-year project, uh, we're aiming to develop a methodology to uh, being able to say which building is, is safe and is secure and is good actually for vertical evacuation. So we have a, a five scaffolding work packages, which I will explain now, uh, which move from the more like the urban scale into the indoor space of the of the probably building. So I will now I will show each one of those work packages. And the first work package aims to identify which buildings could be useful for vertical evacuation. And instead of relying on what we think as researchers, we try to collect the uh, people's knowledge of what people think that could be a safe building for vertical evacuation. Vertical evacuation. So what we're doing for that, we're using a virtual reality, urban virtual reality. We are not working actually with computer, um, fully computer generated, generated urban environment because it's super heavy for the computers to run smoothly. So basically what we're using, uh, we're using a, for each case study, we have case, uh, four case studies in Chile, we're using um, a set of 360 degree photography, omnidirectional photography that we check with a special camera. Uh, it's typically 500 to 900 um, pictures that we actually capture in the field work. Um, and we, we join, we connect this uh, with this virtual panorama and we can build up a, a virtual reality experience that actually users can navigate and can, mo can move through. And what we ask people when we do the experiment, as you can see here in the figure in the upper left corner, and um, we ask them to just move freely uh, if that a tsunami emergency is happening, and we ask them to move until they find a building that they actually they deem safe for vertical evacuation. No more instructions than that. So basically, uh, it's quite interesting because when we post process, uh, of course, everything is, ca is, is captured automatically by the computer. So when we post-process those findings, we can identify hotspots, as you can see here on the bottom right um, image, of those buildings that 
gather the higher number of preferences from the people. At the same time, we can develop a very accurate evacuation profile for each person because um, the helmet the, or the, the headset allow us to uh, capture each decision, the decision making process of the people. As you can see that in a huge database where you can see how the person is moving, you can record that, you can compare that to the actual map of the city and see how they travel through the city when they are uh, undertaking this simulation. And the other interesting thing is that the, the, each figure is divided in, in a set of grid spaces, as you can see here, so we can track how the people look within each panorama. So basically we have a map of how the people were looking inside the panorama, and then we use a deep machine learning to classify those images. So actually we can see what people were looking at while they were looking for a, a building to escape. So you can, here is the, one of the panoramas, of course here is, it, you know, developed into a flat image. This is not flat when you use the headset. And then on the right, you can see the classification of this same uh, picture. So you can see, and then you have a list of what people were looking at, uh, either a sky, grass, trees, buildings, cars, people, etc. So basically, with that procedure, we can do, we can know which buildings are preferred by people, and also we can get an evacuation profile of each person, and also of the whole group of uh, interviewees. Typically, we have 100, about 100 interviewers per per case study. What we do next is that once we know those buildings, what we try to do is to assess the likely impact of them on a common evacuation process. Of course, as uh, evacuation is not happening every day, or every time we do evacuation modeling, we use the technique called agent-based modeling. You, you can see a video here of that, um, of that kind of modeling, where you can simulate the evacuation process, and you can overlay that evacuation process with the modeling of the incoming tsunami. Uh, you may see in there. So um, that income, you can compare, for instance, the, uh, how the evacuation rate increase or decreases depending on whether you use or not the building. You can also uh, find out which building may have the largest impact on reducing evacuation casualties, for instance. So there are a lot of analysis that you can use, you can do using the, the, this model. Um, this is, so, for, for instance, you can see some of the results of the agent this modeling. Um, I will not explain each one of these figures, but in the upper row, you see the case with only with um, horizontal evacuation, which means no vertical buildings for evacuation. And in the bottom row, you can see uh, the impact or the changes on the average uh, death ratio that the inclusion of these vertical evacuation buildings uh, may, uh, will uh, provoke. So that so you can see that the, the more yellow the image is, is the largest number of the people. So you can see the change in this different scenario, and that change is uh, provoked by these solutions of, of vertical evacuation shelters that you can include. In the work package, package three, what we try to do is to examine those buildings. Now that we know which buildings are preferred by the population, and we also know. Uh, which of those buildings uh, would provoke the largest impact on reduction of casualties, we can go inside the buildings and try to analyze them. Uh, we can, for that, we were using also agent-based modeling. This agent-based modeling, you can use it on a large urban scale, but also you can go very, very detailed uh, to do like indoor simulations because uh, you can map each obstacle that you may found inside a building layout, for instance, and see how those, um, specific layouts may uh, lead to a one outcome or, or, or another in the evacuation process. But also we want to know what people, how people can move uh, inside those buildings, how uh, linking to Claudine's talk, how they may orientate, what the wayfinding process inside the building would be like. And for that, we, we are using again virtual reality, now in an indoor scale. I'm not sure that you, we will hear this, but um, Rodrigo, can you hear the audio or is it just, just the image? The music, can you hear it? No, we are not hearing the music. Ah, sorry, sorry. Let me, I will, I will share my screen again because I, I think that I share without them, without sharing audio. Yes, yeah, sound. Yeah, sorry about that. 
I will go straight into that. Probably now you can hear the, um, hopefully you will hear the audio now. Inside the time on that so um so that in that in that manner we will uh, examine how each building will or may work uh, for vertical evacuation and the last work package is of course on a structural analysis we're working also with structural engineer team from the catholic university in santiago and actually we're trying to see if those buildings will be capable of withstanding first the earthquake and then the incoming tsunami impact, which right now the Chilean uh, building code does not request that capacity. So we're trying to see if these buildings are capable of not of, uh, capable enough of uh, withstanding those those com combined uh, loads. Um, lastly, we are hoping to have a final fifth work package where we're trying to bring all the information together, cross discuss it with experts and also for people with the community, and try to finally, hopefully. Uh, develop a scoring, you know, a score to classify these buildings and to try to understand why those buildings rank high and why some buildings uh, rank low in this kind of analysis. So thank you ma very much, Rodrigo. That would be my presentation. Well, thank you, Jorge. Uh, I, I imagine that uh, there are a lot of questions and comments from the audience. Um, just to note, note that uh, in your presentation, when you showed the video, you you were explaining uh, the, the the phenomenons, the processes there, but uh, we couldn't uh, hear you over the the music. Uh, the music was was louder. Ah, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, that is. You, you had to blame my research assistant because yeah, I asked him to put some music on the on the background because otherwise it's too quiet, everything too silent, but. Probably he didn't tune out the volume. So <laughs> I apologize for that. Not by blame. I had to blame on him. But uh, here's the thing 
Well, we try, uh, I was trying to explain that basically when you put on the, the headset and experience, uh, you can choose a building to go in, and then you you just you are just given the instruction that uh, go inside the building and try to find a, a spot that you deem safe because a, a tsunami is occurring right now, and then you might say you can freely navigate the building um, until you decide that uh, the you are safe. Then you can stop the experience, and I, automatically the uh, headset experience is linked to a digital beam model. BIM model. Uh, so basically, you can have a 3D map of the actual evacuation route that that person is um, taking uh, until he or she reaches the safe the safe uh, spot. That was what I was trying to say. So you have this very accurate map of how the people move inside the building. And you can do a lot of post processing things with that. And but I, of course, yeah, I have no time to talk about that. But that was that what I was trying to say was. <laughs> Below the music, behind the music, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge, for the clarification. Uh, I would like to take this two minutes before the 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 the, the, the debate the debate the round table itself to to um, comment about the impressions of uh, the tsunami are uh, an immediate decision scenario so you you both remarked that uh, how we can use cognition how we can use the, the previous practice the moment before as mentioned claudine uh, in, in her presentation and the importance also of the language the visual language that is materialized in in a wayfinding in a sign uh, and how this can be transferred to decisions in uh, in a in a horizontal evacuation, but also in a vertical evacuation. Um, Jorge also remarked the, uh, the role of uh, technologies uh, in order to trans to train to 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 transfer that moment uh, in a in a moment uh, before also to to just to 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 define to figure out how to how we can uh, find a way to 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 to, to say. Um, that's the, the comments. I don't know, Clinton, if you have any other comment or impression from the presentations. I thought the, the, the two of them together make a really nice compliment. Um, Claudine, I, I, the one thing that really struck out to me was the cohesive, consistent, and combative that you mentioned. Uh, I love that, um, that framing of, of intervention. I see uh, Klaus's comment about uh, um, visuals on the buildings and I think that that idea of cohesive consistent and combative and combative being I think you explained it as as being um, uh, not necessarily antagonistic but strong enough to be perceived and in, in, within uh, an existing environment so I really thought that was a uh, uh, really great for me um, uh, analogy or, or a concept around how we design an emergency and probably not just emergency settings yeah, uh, your words, Clinton, also uh, re resonates uh, as the how we can read, how we can understand the the, the, the space, the the three three dimensional space. I think uh, this is a really important uh, aspect also to before to design any sign or any technology to do how how people can figure out and can understand the the the, the, the space. Uh, we can imagine, uh, Jorge, I don't remember if you mentioned, but Viña del Mar is a touristic uh, city. Uh, every season, a lot of people come uh, into the city, into the spaces, and they probably cannot figure out, cannot read the, the, the distances, the, the time that uh, this uh, evacuation requires. So there are big, big uh, challenges on, on that. So I would like now to introduce Jose Alar, my colleague uh, and friend, as I mentioned before, Jorge, uh, Jose, sorry, will uh, uh, he will moderate the debate now. And Jose, we are helping you with the questions in the in the the chat uh, board. If uh, anyone has a question, can uh, turn on the mic uh, and and just uh, uh, tell it. Uh, just make makes the questions with the with the Zoom uh, sound. But uh, Jose. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Claudine, and, and, and thank you, Jorge, for your presentations. Super interesting. Uh, I, I'm agreed they are both uh, complementary and uh, uh, 
And as we receive questions, I see that there are some already very interesting question in the in the in the chat. Um, I would like to start asking both of you uh, a question. I, we understand that this is a super complex uh, uh, issue, uh, and uh, and of course, in both cases, there are many and very complex uh, legal frameworks uh, surrounding your projects. Uh, I know this is probably the, the most boring question, uh, I could, but but they are really relevant. I mean, uh, I, I would like to know how you both have deal with this or how uh, through your project, you have been able to change some uh, laws or change some state of uh, yeah, the legal situation or the legal frameworks that could allow your projects become real. I just, mine's pretty simple. I mean, I, I was just going to say, and I, I was asking Jorge, like how the city and permitting and the collaboration, because it really, you're working within a system that's already there and it becomes speculative if you can't get the buy-in or the support. The very first tsunami signage for Santa Barbara had to go through, I kid you not, beautification committee. It was a city com beautification committee and I wasn't there. It had to be the emergency manager that went to this committee to say, are these evacuation signs beautiful enough to be put in the city? So it's like, I didn't even know that that existed. I, you know, the system that we're in, um, but that kind of collaboration, I will say having support like with Yvette and the California governor's office, NOAA helped pay also, the funding is also a big part of the logistics. That's so important to this work. Um, but without their support, I, the trust I feel, once the the value of design was adopted, it really gave me freedom to work within those constraints of legalities of you know these committees of things that had to go through approval process to actually um, make these happen. I'm sure it's so different with architecture. That's and I was. Um, where I was wondering about the city permits and the collaboration, because that really is a partnership um, that has to happen. And it's a lot of education on my part, but then I will say now, Yvette, who's here, she champions this work also because um, it, it does take that partnership to, to do that. What about you, Jorge? Uh, yeah, this indeed, this is a very delicate topic. Um, uh, ONEMI is the Chilean Emergency Management Agency, probably it's like FEMA in the United States. And about six to, six to seven years ago, something around that, they released a brochure. And the first brochure that actually includes uh, a statement says that in case you cannot reach a higher safe ground, vertical evacuation is a recommended uh, second option. And some colleagues of mine in, from Citizen, Citizen, they collaborate in developing that workshop. And they actually they had to bring, bring in um, lawyers, actually, to find the actual words that uh, may, may not imply a liability in case something wrong happens, you know? <laughs> so, uh, because no one want, actually wants to take responsibility because actually no one knows which building could be safe for vertical evacuation so far. So we have that, and probably when when I when I, I I learned about that a few years ago, that was my the trigger for my research interest in this topic. I said, I said okay, if this we are recommending people to go into a building to save their lives, but we don't know anything about these buildings, how can we be doing that? You know, I mean, I know that it has to be done, but no one knows how to how to do it. So basically, we. Um, we're trying to move forward in that area. It's very difficult. Right now, we are beginning to collaborate this with the regional branch of ONEMI, or the emergence, uh, but of course, it, it will need a, a, a full change in the emergency management framework, I think, in Chile. Because uh, the, the key thing is, is, is that you have to make people, owners of private buildings, to open the buildings and allow people from the street, you know, the strangers, basically, to go into the building. And as uh, Rodrigo and Jose may endorse, probably we're not undergoing a, a high social confidence moment here in Chile and during, since in the last two to three years at least. 
So it's very it's a very hard thing to do. With that, we we have had some conversation with some um, building managers uh, to provide some kind of trade off. For instance, we have we had some conversation with people here in Benyermal. They ask us, okay. I may allow people to go inside my building as long as you develop an evacuation plan for us, you know, because they don't know, they don't even know what to do with their people, with the people who live there, because you have, you know, up to the eighth floor, probably those people are potential victims of the tsunami too. So then you have uh, indoor evacuees, people who live there, then you have people coming from the outside. Basically, probably you will have to explore a lot of uh, legal type of stuff like uh, tax reductions or things like that to make this feasible, actually. I see. Thank you. Thank you. And, and your answer also opened many other questions for me, but I, I would like to open the microphone uh, or open uh, to Josefina Bravo, who has been writing some, some... Hi, everyone. Hi, Josefina. Nice to see you. <laughs> Hi, nice to see you. Thanks, Jose. Thank you, Rodrigo. And um, thank you to Jorge and Claudine for your amazing presentations. I'm just going to write what I uh, read, what I wrote here, because I think um, I kind of captured what I was thinking. I, I, I think it's, um, I was more um, familiar with Claudine's work, but I wasn't familiar with Jorge's work. I think it's so interesting to sort of crowdsource knowledge about buildings, like good candidates to look into. Um, and from a research point of view, I think uh, as a designer, ob obviously the, the methods that you were describing, Jorge, kind of aim more at modeling. So I, I was just wondering whether there was a sort of like a fieldwork component or it was all about using technology and maybe had to do with how much data you wanted to get. Because um, as designers, I mean, I would have thought just going out there with the people, but obviously if you want to do many case studies and you know 100 per people per per building and then um i also wanted to ask whether it was a condition that people needed to know the area so sort of based on familiarity with the area or or um if you were looking at some other clues about what makes a building sort of look right to evacuate yeah, considering that most of the time coastal areas in summer times are full You've got tourists, so tourists, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, uh, thank you, Josefina, for your questions. Um, yeah, uh, about the first questions, uh, in the last six to seven years, we've been working with horizontal evacuation, and we have made that transition that you are asking about. We began with models. But now we're also surveying people's behavior during evacuation drills. And we also use um, cell phone data to actually assess uh, actual evacuation behavior during the, major, du during the most recent emergencies that we have had here. Um, so our, our plan is to do a similar validation process, from, uh, I would call it that, like that in, in the case of vertical evacuation. But, but uh, as you correctly say that there is there are some problems of um, I would say like the size of the sample because it's not easy to bring 150 people uh, put them inside a building and get the permissions actually to do that kind of or, or, or of job inside a building but um, we definitely have it in in our um, schedule one of the things that we're trying to do is um, rather than uh, writing an experiment we are waiting for the next um, evacuation in Chile, which hopefully, no, not hopefully, but probably an earthquake may happen soon here. If they happen all the time, that wouldn't be, wouldn't be a strength. And then probably using the security camera that the buildings have to actually to try to capture the, the behavior of the people. Not really running a drill, but actually trying to capture the real behavior of the people. So it's one of the ideas that we have, uh, but we're waiting for an actual earthquake to happen and then collect the information from the security camera. And, and about the familiarity, uh, yes, it is important, but probably the worst case scenario is that an earthquake may happen during summertime, as Jose said, here, for instance, here in Viña del Mar, where the university is, probably the population may double during summertime and in some areas. So basically, during our experiment, we try to open that. Actually, when we 
try the, the Hetra experience in Villa del Mar uh, about, I'm not 100% sure, but about 30 to 40% of the people who actually uh, uh, undertook the experience were not from the city. They were tourists, uh, either Chilean or foreigners. So basically, uh, we tried to, of course, we identify them to separate their, their answers. But, the, but, but we, we try to bring on that kind of uh, uh, unexpert be, uh, behavior. And the last thing you ask if, um, what about, ah, why people prefer some buildings and not others? Yes, we, we, we run a, we apply a next questionnaire after the experience. And I would say that probably 50% of the people they mentioned uh, about the height and the structure. You know, it's, it, it is a straightforward decision, at least from the point of view what they declare. They're looking for a building that is high and they look for a building that looks solid, probably. That's it. Most Thank of the questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> my pleasure. I think Clinton has a, a question also. Yeah, I just wrote it in there, but I, I think um, going back to Claudine, your comment about um, accessibility and for non-able-bodied uh, people, and then this is really for both of you to, to maybe respond to, and that is just that it seems like, um, the, the kind of non-optimal or multiple scenario responses to uh, an emergency situation uh, make it a little more complicated, right? Both in strategy and in communication. And maybe uh, you can share a little bit about how you, um, how you for Claudine, how you've um, navigated that as that's uh, become more of an area of interest. And Jorge, how you maybe uh, foresee that potentially playing out in, in your work uh, around non-able-bodied or non-optimal sort of um, strategies or plans. I was, I was just writing that comment, like, oh, how we thought, like, uh, alternative formats has been really a way. So the work that I've told, bare minimum now, when I, the maps, and I'm, I'm talking to people who do mapping as an infrastructure for evacuation information, will not be accessible. You cannot do an, an, an alt, an option of a map and make it accessible to uh, the blind or, you know, you have to think about alternative formats, which means budgets. So the bare minimum though, every time I work uh, with, uh, with a city now, we either have QR codes. So the PDF that's accessible to screen readers because these maps exist in context of other information on, in some cases, at least, settings or screen reader software available uh, and zooming. I mean, so the QR code was a big, uh, just a standard for that ability, but it doesn't answer things. It, the color blindness of all of the maps are tested for contrast, um, at least AA contrast. Um, color doesn't have significant meaning on its own. There's no use of all uppercase ever, like at all anymore in the work that I do. But with the maps, and that's the part, that's the part I always say, that's now thinking about alternative formats. What are we saying about this map that can be interpreted in sign language, that can be interpreted in audio, that can be, and so that's the part that we're, that I'm thinking about. And it really does come to budgets. And I, I know Klaus is here. I always use the COVID, was it the United COVID website from the government who did have alternative formats off the bat like already signed videos, it had large print, it had different languages, all right there um, in one um, option. And I thought, wow, that's a really, really interesting way of thinking about public information in one go. It wasn't a subset, it wasn't like, hold on, in three weeks, we'll get the other alternative formats. It was at the same time. And I and I think that if we could start thinking about that, at least, and I, you know, um, Jorge, I'm, I, <laughs> I have the, I think the, the building part and you know stairs and elevator and that's a whole other level for those with physical disabilities so i'm not i was thinking i was going to ask you the same but um that's what i'm thinking about as far as um, the work that i'm doing and what 508 compliance is and so i'm just you know starting to really holistically think about what those standards are and how it could be better uh, yes um i mean you may me Think about that because um, for vertical evacuation, um, it's a huge problem. Um, um, in other countries, um, when they, like in Indonesia or Japan, when they when you have uh, those 
buildings that have been purposely designed for vertical evacuation. They are much more inclusive. For instance, they have ramps instead of stairs. So basically, you can every person, like basically with some help, can reach to a safe ground. And of course, if if you design a new facility with that purpose here, you can also include those kind of um, of um, design traits. But the problem is that uh, I was thinking about how to how to include that kind of um, enhancement for exist in existing buildings. I think it's quite difficult. Even the problem with the with the elevators, you know that the, the lifts, uh, at least in Chile, here where there is an earthquake, typically they are blocked. They don't work because there is some risk that they, they, they could have been damaged or you cannot really guarantee it, it, their, uh, their safety. So basically the stairs are the only, in most of the buildings will be the only way to reach to a safe ground in existing buildings. It's important to underline that. So yeah, it's a question for, I don't have an answer for that. Um, on the on the other side for the science and the stuff, probably there, there, there are some things that we can do. Actually, I did not mention this, but with Rodrigo, we are testing some um, evacuation signs for supporting the, the vertical evacuation process. And then, of course, it's very a preliminary work, but you can go very far into that, that kind of uh, analysis. Probably you can include uh, uh, everything for different kind of audiences. But with the movement itself, itself, I think it's quite difficult and I do not have a, a straightforward answer for that. Actually, how it could be done for people with, for instance, physical disabilities, how you pick those people that can allow them to reach to a safe floor. I really don't know uh, right now. I would have to give it a, a many, many more think to that. We have a question here from Saskia. I don't know, Saskia, if you want to uh, ask it. Uh, it's, it's not really a, hi, it's not really a question. It's more of a, oh, I made a link um, in that. So the Design Network for Emergency Management, we have five founders in total. One of the founders, Tinji Lin, uh, I know that one of her team members is looking into dynamic signage. Um, in this case for fire evacuation within buildings, but I think this could be also a very interesting link to make um, in, that as, in, in that respect. So I think already Clinton and, and Rodrigo, we're seeing lots of interesting new avenues for potential research opening up. So congratulations on organizing this. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know how, how we are with time, Rodrigo. I have like three we are, questions. We are, but, we are, oh. Sorry, we are okay with, with time, and I would want to make the note that uh, Tingi is in, probably without uh, the camera, but uh, Tingi, if you are there, uh, you can take the mic. Yeah. And, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I'm here. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, it's a six o'clock in the morning in Taiwan, uh, and I'm so happy to see everyone here. Uh, and. Thanks, uh, for uh, Saskia, to mention about the signage uh, research you have been doing and um, the dynamic, uh, because uh, a lot of people, uh, not only the researchers, but also the design, um, the young people in design fields are very um, uh, energetic in doing some kind of a dynamic pictograms. Uh, and uh, if, if I have an opportunity, I would like to share with you some uh, findings or uh, the design projects with you. Yeah, the dynamic pictograms, dynamic iconic system, uh, it's not only for uh, lost medias or um, uh, interesting um, uh, creativity fields, but also uh, several research for design for the uh, emergencies or design for social, um, Practices uh, uh, has, has been discussing and doing here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very thank you. much, Tingy. No, I, I was I was about to ask uh, if I'm if I may, Rodrigo. Uh, I, I have dozen of questions, uh, but uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. Just just uh, uh, one uh, is probably a, ref a reflection. I think in both cases. Uh, demonstrate that this situation is uh, very 
very con contextual. I mean, it, it is super difficult. I mean, it's super different what could be happening in a coast area uh, in San Francisco or in uh, Valparaiso. Uh, uh, Claudine, I think some of your maps were showing how, how people could evacuate using cars uh, while uh, the, the project Corky was working is mainly based on, on pedestrian uh, evacuation. Uh, so my question is, uh, this is probably one of the cases that um, trying to pursue an uh, international standard is probably super difficult. So it's super contextual based. Is that right? I mean, just in the state of California, and also I didn't mention that we are doing walking maps. So I didn't, I didn't highlight that. I was, uh, it's the close-up maps that show yeah, walking. Yeah, yeah. So there's walking, uh, but just even in the state of California, right when we passed, it was the Redwoods National Park that had a completely different color code system. Exactly. And it's this we're still in the same state, and that it's the community already knew yellow and green instead of red and blue. So it, it, it it's I think the appropriate way to do it is you go community to community and what sense makes sense to that community. And it wouldn't be, it's a, the approach could be standardized, right? There's a methodology there, but I think part of the most significant and important part is benchmarking, getting to know, know the context that you're, you're drawing from, because it's going to, it's going to be completely different. Even, you know, even in this very singular state, it was, it was very different. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, Jose. <laughs> the question is yes. Probably is very contextual based. Uh, so far, we have uh, four case studies in Chile. Probably, you, of course, you know this city. We're working in uh, Arica, Iquique, Viña del Mar, and Talcahuano, which are very different cities um, uh, from each other. But um, so far, we're processing the data. I'm not sure yet what the outcomes will be, uh, but I can see that is. It's not the, the, the contextual differences are not really related to physical conditions, I would say, but rather to um, culture and knowledge. Um, Arica and Iquique are cities that um, have undergone decades of you know announcements of a very big earthquake coming. So the people are really educated about it. So when you ask, when you talk to them, when you interview them. Uh, when they take the experience, they really know what to do. Uh, on the other hand, you have the tourists that we interview in Valparaiso and Viña, which very, which were very clueless about the the whole tsunami thing. So probably it's a, it's a it, it, it has a lot of cultural differences, but related to knowledge, I would say knowledge about the hazard, knowledge about what to do during a hazard of this time. It, this is. Uh, it's a very good example in, in La Serena, which uh, is, there is another, it is another touristic Chilean city. Like two to three years ago, there was a huge earthquake, 6.9, something like that. And there was an evacuation, and there were hundreds of thousands of Argentinian tourists, and they really didn't know what to do at all, you know, uh, because the, the alarm they, they received, the, we have this uh, automatic emergency warning system that it reaches, it reaches your phone, but they reached this uh, kind of warning. But the warning says evacuate to high ground, and they didn't know uh, what, why they had to evacuate, where to head to, and basically what happens that they follow Chilean people who were running to the hills and they already knew what to do. So probably the, the main difference comes from that part of the equation rather than the social environmental conditions from the specific point of view. And Jorge and Claudine, could could your project have you ever thought that your project could become also a mortal trap? I mean, so in, in the case, get... sorry, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be uh, catastrophic. I'm triggering but, uh, my nine year olds. <laughs> a, a mortal trap uh, uh, in the sense that uh, I remember talking with some Japanese colleagues that uh, while they were trying to do an uh, evacuation map for tsunamis, the border was so yes. clear that people thought that the yeah. wave will never reach them. But I mean, of course, the thing was a, a little bit more diffuse. So, oh my so, gosh. Uh, so those kind of uh, learning, or for example, I was wondering uh, in the case of vertical evacuation, if a uh, building gets super packed, uh, probably those buildings near the beach will be probably the first in become super cool. Huh? Uh, so 
um, I guess those are probably also variables that you, you guys uh, consider when you are doing your designs or your projects. Well, that's the one thing with, oh my gosh, it's like when I was nine, <laughs> it's this disaster apocalypse. Like I'm like, oh, you know, the what ifs and, and like, I've seen that movie. And so I try to bring that, like, you know, after hearing that, and that's why I was meaning with the exaggerations that the state allowed me to like, do, this is the line, like scientifically data collected, but do you want it could, you know, will the inundation, do you want people to use that freeway? Is there a possibility that would be flooded? That would be a disaster. And then they said, yes, no, we don't want. So that flexibility and exaggeration and, you know, and not being and not relying on data is so important. Now that's just the boundary. So yes, we have, we have definitely dealt with that and I've really questioned the line versus what we want the behavior, what the potential is. And I also will say we, there's playbooks in the state of California, right? There's varying degrees of tsunami events you know, so um, some of the earlier maps, we worked on the worst case scenario, which had a whole discussion about evacuation because we'll have maybe half of the city who didn't need to evacuate evacuating. And so that portion of it had to be discussed and, and sort of weighing out those kinds of um, consequences versus, you know, over, uh, over, uh, uh, sorry, over communicating versus under communicating and the consequences of that. But I'm sure there's something else, like you said, um, when I was working for school reunification, I worked with uh, for San Diego uh, County School District, where all of the principals, all the upper administration said every parent will walk onto the campus because it's a neighbor. All the schools K through 12 are in the same neighborhood. When I interviewed the parents, they all said they would drive because that's a natural, you know, instinct to grab your child and leave this island. And um, and then they said, oh, shoot, we didn't even built in traffic control. So it was through that just a survey it wasn't even designed. It was just through surveying. They started to build in traffic control because they didn't even think that that would be a possibility. So I'm sure there's something, you know, that with each layer that you're appealing, there could be there's something there that has to be questioned. Right. Because there, there there is it's my my whole life of thinking the what ifs. Right. You know that one of the motivation of my work is what happened in Japan in 2011. Uh, also, that some people died actually in vertical evacuation shelters. They were swept away by the tsunami. Uh, they collapsed, and those people who told that they are going to be safe in those places actually they they had to die because of that decision they made. So. Uh, if, it is not very common in evacuation studies to um, vertical evacuation studies to go into the building. You know, uh, you, you may have a lot of studies actually that they assess them as dots, you know, in the city. And they all, 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 all the time they are examined like an adverse eye point of view, you know, like very tiny dots and they run these urban models and you can see people going over there, which works, which is fine. I think, of course, you need that. It, it, is, it is also part of our research, but at my, I thought that it was very necessary to go into the building. And, and one of the way of going inside the building is to, from the wi fi point of view, as, as I showed you, but also the, the idea is to run this agent by indoor agent based modeling is to actually be 100% uh, sure that the actual the building has the capacity to deal with this kind of process, you know, that no bottlenecks will occur. Uh, that at least people can move in a third time safe way and, and things like that. Uh, of course, at some point, uh, reality comes in. Probably you, 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 you cannot really control what people can do, do, do in um, a panic situation. But I would say that if you train people, if you, if you show people what to do, uh, uh, um, a little bit that, that you said before that um, if you show, if through repetition, you train certain behaviors, probably you can minimize those very undesirable side effects, you know, to actually to kind of know how many people can go into, into each building, how to tell people when a building is already full of people and you cannot go there and then you have to move to the next one. And then and you know there is another available one. So for it, because if you know that there are 20 possible evacuation buildings, you're not going to get into panic if you see that one is already full, you know what I mean? So that, that spreading that kind of that kind of information to everyone probably 
it would be a, a good tool to avoid those kind of undesirable outcomes to happen. Wow. This is fantastic. Rodrigo, I think you, you, you have yes, the... I just was, uh, want, want to mention uh, before to the, 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 the end is uh, coming, uh, uh, is closing, uh, uh, the, the comments from comments in the chat, you can see everyone going to the chat uh, button uh, in the bottom uh, part of uh, Zoom. Uh, Yvette Laduke uh, comments about the maps Claudine produces are a very valuable, valuable part of tsunami education in California. These maps are a critical communication tool that provide people in the coastal area with critical information if, if they need to evacuate. For tsunami, so uh, I don't uh, wanted to 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 pass this. Uh, Klaus also had a, had a question before to Jorge about the if there are or are there plans for visual on the real building indicating their availability for vertical evacuation. Uh, Saskia uh, want to make a connection between Jorge and Claudine. Maybe you can. Uh, connect uh, further and make uh, some uh, explorations. Uh, then um, Josefina, well, she ma made that uh, question comment in, in person. Thank you, Josefina. Clinton also. Uh, Klaus is uh, sharing uh, the COVID platform uh, for, uh, for information, I think, in emer emergency New Zealand. Uh, and I would like to make a, a specific highlighting in the uh, Sara Bustamante is, a, is telling about the tactile and acoustic landmarks could, could also be explored with the vertical evacuation in buildings. And uh, Maximilian Dixon, many thanks to share for sharing the Washington State uh, uh, pedestrian uh, walking evacuation maps. So, so really interesting uh, material to explore. Uh, well, I, I would like, Clinton, you have, a, a, I think, a last uh, question or comment uh, I would like to give you. And I have a, a, a three three points uh, remarking at the end. Yeah, I, yeah I, I just wrote in there the last thing of like, I think this, this uh, sort of theme of complex instructions or, or responses um, uh, I, I suggest maybe there's a fourth C to the cohesive, consistent, and combative, uh, Claudine, that, that uh, has something to do with allowing people to either um, filter down to the message that are, that are specific to them um, or somehow preparing them to accept um, more nuanced communications around um, these types of things. I don't have any answers there, but I think that theme as we have things like the pandemic of COVID and things like that, that or, or able-bodied oriented response, you know, that, that, that highlight that, but don't allow for uh, the non-able-bodied. When we start to have that, um, it, it raises this, this underlying theme of how do we either filter or prepare um, citizens or, or viewers to accept and not just accept an easier message, which is conspiracy theory <laughs> that is pounded over and over again, um, either prepare them for that or filter it so that they get the message that's particular to them in a simple, uh, comprehensive, or co cohesive, consistent, and combative fashion. So that's that's yeah, that's the yeah. theme that I'll take from this, that I think there's a, some there's an underlying cultural phenomenon. I don't know that it's particular to our time, but it's particular um, to the media and the, and the ways we digest and perceive information today that's um, kind of unique. And I'll just say just one, it's designers as a it's discipline, we tend to get into roles of that we're doing something for a community. And I want to switch that to we, it's a we design and it's a partnership with public. And I, when I work with giving the empowerment of the public to be involved in the design process and not like, oh, just wait, we're doing this magical thing and then we're going to release it. That is antiquated. That is not how you're going to get to where you, what you're mentioning. Um, Clinton, I think it's a start is when we invite people, communities into this process and not keep it separate. Um, so it's like this idea of uh, des design with and not design for. Yeah, there's a there's maybe a tyranny of the artifact, right? Um, that that we focus so much on the artifacts rather than maybe the social systems and networks that um, have more resilience for that nuance, maybe. 
And so working in both of those environments of, of the artifactual or intervention oriented um, and the, the relational um, um, community-based aspect. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, 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 reading the, the chat, I missed the offering from Tingji also. She, it, 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 she will be very happy to share some design examples and outcomes in the near future. We are considering to have uh, uh, the participants, the, the, the members from uh, the D Design Network for Emergency Management in the following session. So we will be happy to know the work from uh, Tingji uh, among other interested people. Um, sorry, I, I'm just taking the, the word again, just to make a three point statement, uh, final statement. Remember that this uh, round table sessions have a very simple purpose, is generate a network on design for emergency, communication for emergency, uh, interdisciplinary discussion uh, about these uh, topics. Uh, really happy, uh, by the way, because of this uh, first uh, conversation. The second point is an invitation to apply, to propose uh, topics that you would like to see in the following uh, sessions. As I mentioned before, we are planning to have one about the expertise from uh, Clinton and his uh, research group in Notre Dame about food recall, food security. Uh, if you are interested or and or if you know someone that can be invited or or or, or uh, presenting uh, their work, we will be very happy. And the third uh, point is please visit us at the D4 figure, d4emergency.org uh, website uh, because we include at the at the website, uh, a section specific uh, about these uh, elements. How do you uh, think you can uh, uh, collaborate? Uh, uh, which uh, topics would, would you like to be included in following sessions? We will be really happy because uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of this uh, first session, we, had, we are just starting uh, to create this, uh, this uh, network and making this uh, collaborative uh, research. Uh, just the, the final word for me is just to say thanks to Claudine, to Jorge uh, for your very, very interesting presentations. A lot of more uh, questions and comments to do, but this is a solid work. And many thanks also, Jose, for your moderation, uh, uh, in, inclusion in, in, in this uh, 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 part uh, from uh, the audience. So I'm really happy, uh, Clinton. Please uh, close the close the session. I, I I would just say thanks as well. I appreciate it. This this has been a great start. Um, this I think uh, is not meant to be Rodrigo and my thing. This is supposed to hopefully amplify uh, the efforts of Denem and 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 um, you all that have joined. So hopefully going forward we continue that continue a great dialogue and uh, just appreciate all the insight of everybody, um, especially. Jorge and Claudine and Jose for facilitating. Okay, I know that around the world also all have to run to pick up the kids, uh, to finish the day or to start the day in the case of Tingi. So <laughs> many thanks about that and bye-bye. Stay in touch. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>